as you put it out. I think it's really, really an angular resolution, not a, a pixel resolution. So it depends on how far away you are. Cool. So I think we should uh, go ahead and get started. So I think today we're probably missing the uh, the some of the Vulcan CNCF people because it is their uh, biweekly call. So, um, so starting from the starting at the top. So welcome to the next network service mesh meeting. Um, we have uh, three meetings. We have this one, which occurs every Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific time. NSM document call, which occurs weekly on Wednesday at 8 a.m. Pacific. And we have the NSM use case, which occurs every second, fourth, and fifth Monday at 8 a.m. Pacific. We do have a NSM use case meeting coming up this next Monday. We are also participating in the CNCF Telecom user group, which occurs every first and third Monday at 8 a.m. Pacific. I notice a trend here. And so um, that one just occurred. So it'll be not next week, but the week after for that one. There is also a CNCF networking working group, which occurs every two weeks on Tuesday at nine Pacific time. We, uh, so we can remove KubeCon EU. We don't, we've already gone over that. It was, it was fun. Now it's done. We'll have fond memories of KubeCon EU. Indeed. It was very fun. We have KubeCon China coming up. And we have an intro in the maintainer talk. And there is also the second telecom user group work, working group kickoff that is occurring as well. We have the DBK user space which occurs uh, a week before ONS. I believe it's like the 18th and 19th of September in Bordeaux. So I've submitted a paper into that talking about, um, similar to FIDO, the state of FIDO in NSM, I submitted a similar, uh, how NSM is using DPDK to, to further the aims of its users. So we will have, um, if, if, if accepted, then I will be giving a talk there. Um, we have ONS Europe itself coming up. The call for paper ends um, in just under two weeks time on June 16th. We have uh, MEF Los Angeles. Uh, do we have anyone who's going to MEF representing there? So, I am. Um, I had to cancel MEF because I have twins due right at that time. So I'd like to stay married, and I've canceled all late fall conferences. <laughs> Congratulations! Congratulations you. to you. Uh, okay. Any good fortune from talks at KubeCon North America the same week? We'll be able to congratulate you. If if one of them's a girl, we I highly recommend Ariadne as a name. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, I'm trying to stay married. <laughs> So we have, um, so do, the question is, do we want to keep MEF 2019 on this? I think we should probably scratch it. Um, there is still a small chance that they use NSM, but our product managers are kind of throwing everything in the kitchen sink in their demo. So I kind of just feel like at this point, I'm going to triage and move on to other projects. Okay. So we have... KubeCon coming up in November. The call for paper ends July 12th. And that is that is going to be, that is going to be on from November, November 18th through 21st. There is a new to be announced edge computing world coming up as well. Um, and so that one may be I, I need to talk with the organizer to see exactly where he wants to take it. But if there is a networking component or networking path, which sounds like there is going to be, then we may want to see, uh, we may want to, to, to work out whether this will be useful for us. Uh, this is started by the same guy who's doing IOT, who did IOT world. Um, so if you have any other events, uh, please add it to the website and please add it to this list. Um, I assume Lucina's not on. Oh, hello. I'm here. Oh, you are on. Cool. So, mm -hmm. social media community team, you're on. Yeah, KubeCon Europe was a really good event for 
folks learning more about Network Service Mesh. Um, there were callouts for NSM in the opening keynotes, as well as in the telecom user group meeting and various other presentations during KubeCon EU. And I tried to search for um, anyone mentioning us by our Twitter, Twitter handle, as well as NSM, Network Service Mesh, all one word or three words, and tried to retweet um, as much as possible. So we gained 45 more followers over the course of the last three weeks. Uh, I slowed down with following folks, <laughs> followed about, over, just over 50 new folks, and um, we've got a total of 133 tweets. And uh, fun, fun news, I actually went to a park in Barcelona where there was a labyrinth and statues of Ariadne. So I'll, I'll try to do some fun posts about that as well. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. It was a beautiful space in Barcelona. And I think I've posted the recap video of the intro and deep dive. And if there are any other Oh, actually, I can also post a recap of the FTIO presentation because those videos have been released as well as the Linux Foundation networking uh, video. So I'll get those out this week, too. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I You're was welcome. Happy to see those go by. Um, so, um, Okay, so release notes. There haven't been any changes to the release notes. I uh, was waiting for the uh, branch to occur before rounding up um, uh, Nikolai and Ed to try to work out uh, any major callouts that we want to have within the first uh, set of release notes before finishing it off. I think there may be happy news on that front. Have we branched? I think the, the folks responsible should probably speak up. <laughs> all I did was look at the all I did was get up and look at the uh, the Slack traffic. Um, are the folks responsible online? Yeah, uh, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Nikolai, have we branched? Yes, we did. So yeah, after having a little bit of crazy weekend, uh, like uh, it was failing, then in the end we apparently merged two patches, which were literally one line each, um, mostly deleting code, <laughs> and then we uh, we had uh, everything uh, everything running. So it's. Um, um, we have the, the branch now. Uh, I still have to figure out how we are going to publish the images uh, because uh, you know the cr credentials are somehow in the CI and probably we need to figure out some automatic way of publishing the release images. But that's something to okay. to be to be figured out and to to, to happen. I think that. We're, we're in a good situation, I mean, in a good position now. Yeah, so Nikolai, I understand looking at the CI as it's going past, we're still having, um, and I've created a new tag for this class of things, things that I'm calling CI bugs, which is yeah. AWS just decided it's never giving us a cluster this time, um, which seems to happen remarkably frequently. Um, yeah. Or um, GoMod is having a conniption fit for some reason. Um, which are actually not problems with our code at all, yeah. but it turns out cloud providers vary wildly in their reliability in terms of providing managed Kubernetes. Uh, not only that, we have seen, for example, uh, our uh, packet, uh, our, our Kubernetes deployment on packet failing because uh, Kates.io was failing to uh, provide us uh, the re relevant pack packages for, for KubeADM to finish its work. So things like that, uh, I mean, like. Uh, <laughs> also, don't forget that um, a lot of this infrastructure, uh, not our infrastructure explicitly, but a lot of the uh, Go infrastructure implicitly runs on, and Docker runs on Google Cloud. Uh, actually, Docker <laughs> one doesn't, uh, but. Uh, and so, so there may have been some issues that we, that we may have had 
intermittently because of that. Uh, something that we should consider though is there's a, um, we can spin up an Athena server uh, in some of these locations that can help store some of these, uh, some of this information, some of this context. So it may make sense to, uh, to bring up a proxy and store some of this in for some of the packages just to help with the go mod if that becomes a, an issue over time. Uh, although it won't help with network connectivity out for the CI. So that's the only problem we run into unless we can work out what cloud they're running in and what region, but uh, we probably won't get that visibility. Yeah, I mean, what, what are the other things over the weekend with Google having um, issues is I saw a joke go by that's all too true, which is um, it turns out when the Google cloud goes down, so does almost everything else. Um, As one person on Hacker News posted who claimed to work at Google, Google's messaging service went out to that they used to describe to work on the failures. Um, okay, uh, they, uh, they, they did claim to have backups online to to deal with this problem, but yes, their their back their backup system is reliant on their rather their messaging service is reliant reliant on their production system, which I guess works for most things as long as your networking isn't that thing that fails. Yeah, I did. I, I, you know. I, I wish very well the Google engineers who doubtlessly work furiously over the weekend. Uh, yeah. Weekend. So. Cool. Oh, well, we'll uh, leave the rest of that since there's no changes to the release notes at the moment. So we'll leave the rest of that for um, for next week when we have more more of that posted. Um, code of conduct. So we have. I was looking over at the requirements for things that we're going to have to do in the future. One of them is we need to adopt a code of conduct in order to become graduated. And they explicitly ask us to, to accept the uh, CNCF code of conduct. But what I would like to do instead, instead of just saying a blanket, let's adopt it. I like to pitch it this week and next, and it'll give time for people to read it and understand it. And then next week we can decide whether this is something. So there's two questions. Number one, is it appropriate? The second question is, is it appropriate to apply it now or should we wait until later? Um, so if you can open the code of conduct. Sure. Cool. So they lots of languages. <laughs> And so this, um, so this is basically uh, a more verbose version of uh, Ted's excellent code of conduct. Um, and so basically it's just to, um, the main things is banning the use of behavior around uh, sexualized language or imagery, personal attacks, trolling, insulting, harassment in both public and private, uh, doxing people who don't wish to be doxed um, without explicit permission um, and a catch-all unethical or unprofessional conduct. Um, the one thing to call out on the bottom is the uh, the section on uh, maintaining a mediator. So if there is a problem between a community member and the um, and the maintainers or a problem between maintainer and maintainer, uh, they do offer the services of a mediator, which is Mishi Chattery. Uh, I have not met Mishi Chattery, uh, so I, I don't know, I can't say anything for or against in that scenario, but I do have some uh, confidence in, in the people that the CNCF has brought on for this kind of stuff, so. Uh, have we have we checked in with Mishi to make sure as we adopt this that um, it strikes me as a kind thing to let someone know that they've been signed up as mediator for the project? Um, yeah, I think I think we should because uh, you know even though it says all CNCF projects and so she uh, she probably is part of like a blanket catch-all in that scenario, but I think we should reach out and introduce the community. Yeah, I I think that's probably wise. I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff that is just. I mean, we're, we're, we're a super friendly and courteous community and, and I like that about us. And, and even though I have no doubt that as a CNCF project, Mishi would stand forward and mediate for us, it's probably kind just to let her know. Yeah, and as always, if you have any problems, um, 
that you can also you can also discuss with us and we'll do our best to to help yep and so it's part of the job of the project maintainer is to um is to enforce the code of conduct yep. uh, it's actually the last line project maintainers who, do, who don't enforce may be permanently removed so it's actually quite a serious clause yep. uh, so um, so I want to give people time to, to read this. Are, are there any comments as well or anything? Because we want to also make sure that if there's anything that we don't want applied in here that we that we call it out as well. Cool. Well, I'm surprised it doesn't uh, say violence directly. But. Well, I, 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 I have been told <laughs> repeatedly by Mike Dolan, who is a, an attorney at the Linux Foundation, that, that weapons on stage are implicitly common um, in the Code of Conduct, or rather the fact that you shouldn't have weapons on stage. So there's a CNCF events Code of Conduct as well uh, on the bottom, which it also links to. So you should also make sure you read that, mm -hmm. uh, which covers, I think, only the events itself. Um, but I think, I think violence definitely, definitely falls under, well, I don't know if it falls under harassment or not. I think Personal attacks. No. <laughs> Personal attacks. Attack. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I think I it's know, a it's, loophole. I think so too. You, you could have an impersonal attack. Uh, I, I, mean, I, 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 <laughs> Great confidence that Mike Dolan would consider physical violence to be covered under this code of conduct. So, um, but yeah, unfortunately, I don't think that's probably going to be an issue for us. Well, uh, unless the violence was uh, voluntary <laughs> <laughs> on both sides. <laughs> anyway, cool. So, um, yeah, I think it's probably good for people to go take a look and redo this. Um, <clears throat> I've taken some time to look through it uh, in detail and was actually super pleased, but the, the looking through it in detail did lead me to realize the degree to which it's probably productive to give some folks time to look at it in detail. Yeah, so let's let's discuss this again next week when people have time have had time to read. Uh, if you don't like the way that something reads, I mean, we can we can do one of two things or one of three things. We could either choose to. Yeah, we can either respond back with feedback saying, hey, we'd like to adopt the code of conduct, but we think it's we think this change should be made. Uh, we could choose to adopt it anyway. I guess there's four things. We could uh, choose to adopt the modified version. And we could choose to not adopt it and do something ourselves. So. So we now we have, is there is there anything else on this or should we jump up to the next uh, jump towards the Andromeda release and start going over the backlog? Yeah, let's move. Cool. You have the floor, Nikolai. Uh, well, the Andromeda release, as we said, uh, the release branch is uh, already on. Uh, we have to figure out the publishing of the images, uh, the properly tagged images, I think that we have everything set up there. Um, in terms of, um, yeah, in terms of the backlog, I think that most of the things are already, yeah. Uh, in the same with IPv6 payload should be, okay, not fully, for the result, but uh, we are testing things there. We can just talk them also. Okay, yeah, and, and you know, many, many thanks for the, the IPv6 stuff. It turns out that IPv6 was, <laughs> IPv6 turned out to be exactly the way IPv6 always was. It always is. <laughs> every, every, every freaking time, and those of us who've been in networking a long time know this, every freaking time you go to test IPv6, you start out with the attitude, oh, this will be fine. And then you just discover lots of little things. <laughs> yeah, the last one was really, mm, <laughs> really interesting. But yeah, we 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 kind of went through it, and uh, 
we have a nice verification uh, in our CI that uh, that we can safely pass uh, uh, IPv6 payloads, and that's been constantly checked. So, so that's good. Um, what else uh, we have here? Um, I think that I don't know. Maybe 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 I need to to, to do a pass here again and check uh, check what's still on, but. Uh, from my personal tests and my experience with the examples, there, I mean, it, NSN behaves pretty, pretty much stable for for the type of project that we. I mean, like the status of the project that we are. I mean, I don't see any obvious huge, uh, you know, crashes and uh, um, misbehavior. Um, I think that this is, uh, of course. Uh, uh, due to the to the extensive integration testing that we are doing and uh, all the all the all the work that we did in the last couple of months for enabling other clouds, which are introducing uh, other uh, you know um, problems in terms of um, delays being slow, being fast, whatever. But then in the end, we obviously have tested a lot, so at least from my point of view, whatever we have in the release branch is something that we should be proud of. So thank you all for uh, putting your efforts uh, with patches and uh, with whatever you were helping. Yeah. I mean, in particular, yeah. thank you to, to all the folks. I know that it's been sort of the steady march of little tiny issues. Um, and then some, some, as we said, some bugs in the CI environment. Um, yeah. Turns out the code is fine, but you know the AWS cluster never comes up. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. And oh, one other quick question, though, because I know we've met you on the phone. Matthew, you have a real knack for running into, you test things differently than everyone else. <laughs> how is it feeling to you? <laughs> uh, I think it's fine for, for now for uh, the 0 0.1. Uh, it, it run pretty well. And uh, no, no one is expecting it to be run for production. So, so it's fine for me. Yeah, I, I, when, when when people ask me about that, I usually um, I usually put it obliquely and say, you know, th we're we're about to do our zero dot one release, which is exactly the way you would expect a zero dot one release to be. Yeah. Awesome. The the good thing is that that people are starting starting to appear within the issues with uh, requirements or some observations. And uh, Matthew, I guess that you have seen uh, there was a post in the uh, in the group about uh, mm. skydive uh, saying yes, some, some so yeah i mean obviously obviously people are testing us and i i think that we are more or less ready for this yeah. um no I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about it as a zero dot one release and we got lots of exciting stuff to to do as we move forward mm -hmm. past zero dot one and I'm, I'm super happy that master is open again that's always exciting <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> we're going to break it soon <laughs> Oh yeah, sure. I mean, it's exactly, <laughs> well, hopefully not break the existing stuff, but um, yeah, you know. yeah. I mean, adding more tests and uh, stuff, and yeah. So uh, I think that we should move. Uh, do we have RAM key on prem on the call? I mean, uh, that's uh, for me from uh, for the Andromeda release. I mean, I expect that uh, before KubeCon China, we should have attack and published images something that can be shown around that's that's my my expectation and plan cool awesome do we want to talk road roadmap going forward because that's always super fun yeah i don't see prem or run key on i i can ping them and see if they can i can ping prem and see if he's willing to hop on while we talk about other things mm -hmm. So uh, the roadmap, uh, yeah, I think that we said this last time. I would really like to keep this this item here for us to remind us where we are, what we do, maybe add things, remove things, kind of checking quickly the status, just just as kind of open yeah. discussion here. So release is clear more or less. The examples we set, um, it's kind of a little bit tight with the next topping, CNCF test bed in everyone. So uh, me and Taylor, uh, we were just having a um, good, nice conversation, actually preparatory conversation 
for the calls to, to, to have uh, this week. So we have scheduled a number of calls with people that are interested in enabling NSM uh, for the CN, CNF, uh, CNCF CNF testbed. Uh, we have some rough plan there. Um, I would really like to see this enablement based on the examples. And I don't know, we'll have a discussion tomorrow We'll figure it out if we are going to push the code there. Are we going to push the code in CNCF? Okay, we'll see this. But the idea is that the examples for me are becoming the, uh, should be from my point of view, the starting place for, for everyone that wants to use and wants to uh, deploy. Well, I, I also think you were talking at some point about, we, we've got a bunch of the examples living both in the repo, uh, in the main repo and in the examples repo. Mm -hmm. and I, also talking about possibly moving the examples into the examples repo and um, you know, because most of the time those examples don't change uh, and so you should just be able to go yes around. that's the point yeah yeah but that's a conversation that we probably should should take offline but I mean it's uh, I I can have it uh, now because we have today much the PR where we are renaming there's no examples folder in the main repo anymore right i mean we moved uh, everything to testing uh, the sidecar container belongs in the sidecar folder so uh, everything is moved to other places so examples are existing by the virtue of just being part of the history and also being part of the, our ci um, maybe we need to figure out some plan for completely removing the things there uh, but okay, this is something that that we can discuss okay. on the Slack also. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, so uh, for Meshery, I know that Lumina were supposed to have something there. I don't know what's the status there unless Prem Prem appears, or at least give us some name that can join. Yeah. Yeah, Prem sent me a message that he's stuck in a uh, in a meeting at the moment. Okay. So, mm -hmm. uh, we should probably punt that to next week. Uh, for SMI, we are going to keep an eye on it. I mean, on, on, on our side, on my side, but for time being, no active movement there. It's a bit of a convoluted topic. I know that people have opinions. Uh, yesterday, uh, on the technical, um, uh, not technical, telco user group meeting, uh, and actually today, uh, someone I don't remember name the name, but uh, no, there was uh, I mean there was uh, an initiation of a white paper like preparation document. So SMI was mentioned there. I don't know how this merges, but I think that we should just keep an eye. That's that's enough. Uh, that's enough for now. Uh, kernel forwarding plane. Radoslav, uh, who is here, he started doing something. Um, as I said in the chat today, I hope that we learned uh, uh, some things uh, along the way of, you know, uh, enabling uh, VPP with IPv6 and, you know, debugging things there. So I think that we learned some things. Maybe we have still a lot to learn. I don't know. We'll see. But we're definitely on the path to, to move this forward. I hope to get some patches for having, um, like, um, today, uh, VPP is uh, very deeply embedded in our testing, uh, in integration testing. So uh, we're planning to have some abstraction there so that you can switch back and forth between the different implementations, which I will hope will make uh, some people feel a little bit better uh, because I have heard um, some opinions about this. Everybody, everybody likes having flexibility on the data plane. Yeah. Uh, and I would really like to stop calling it data plane because that's not what our glossary is saying. So, okay. uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, maybe we need to re rename things also, but <laughs> I, 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 I'm always open for re-education. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah. use the term, we can use the term subnet provider. Oh no, let's not use that. Well, let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Security has been a thing that, that we've talked about a lot. And um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I had some, some, some discussions with some folks around here, um, got some, some advices, ideas, but I, I don't know. I mean, 
I'm, I'm ready to, to participate in discussions about it if these exist, but um, yeah. So I, I scribbled something down mm -hmm. for security that, I, yeah, that you may want to go take a look at, which sort of looks at it and says, okay, um, let's sort of look at how we handle identity authentication, mm -hmm. prop authorization, um, not only for like the, the current single domain case that we have, but looking forward to a multi-domain case or an inter-domain case yeah. as well. Um, so go have a look at that, see if it makes sense to you, um, you know, and, and, and see, you see kind of what makes sense. And then part of it was, came out of comments from conversations at KubeCon where folks were like, look, you know, the Spire guy, the Spiffy and Spire guy is just about solve federation, um, which is going to be super important. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to hear or someplace else talk through a little bit of that my thoughts there and i'm very much open to other thoughts and ideas and, and please god review because security is the kind of thing that the more eyeballs you get on what you're doing the better off you are so um, this I'm, might be something worth eventually setting up some form of a technical uh, work group specifically to to go over security things on a, on a so I know that that they seek security, and actually, uh, I popped in uh, uh, one of their uh, group meetings there at KubeCon, and they were saying something that they are, uh, you know, doing things like project evaluation, you know, security evaluation of the project, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. like audits. But uh, they can also do kind of pre pre audit, uh, just you know, because there are appear to be people that, that actually are deeply into security, so they know the common mistakes that people make, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know if it's worth involving them at this stage, but I'm just saying that we might want to think about it at some point. Yeah, I mean, so I actually bumped into Justin Kapos okay. while waiting for my flight, and he's involved with the CNCF doing their security audits. Yep. And, and so what I probably, you know, minimally, I'm going to point him to our current, you know, to the current scribbles, okay, um, so that he can take a look and see what his thoughts are. Um, and, I, and I've I've talked to some of my internal security folks um, about the general gist of it. Um, mm -hmm. I even I even <laughs> dug the security fellow um, here at Cisco, yeah. and yeah, and 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 he was positive-ish about the issue. Um, now, admittedly, he then went on to give a talk about how you continue to secure things in a post-quantum computational world, which was interesting. But um, <laughs> okay, uh, so I mean, no, no one vantage point necessarily here is that you've gotten it right. But the more eyeballs we get, the better. Um, well, which actually reminds me that if we have these scribbles, maybe I can post them to someone on our side too, so that's, that's good. Yeah, no, I mean, we, we all, you know, for the most part, we all come from places that have some version of really deep security humans around. <laughs> true, true, true. true. <laughs> and, and, and so you know, to the degree that we can, it behooves us to get them to weigh in. Um, but I, I was particularly heartened by the security fellow being positive-ish, especially since he has a history of being challenging. Um, <laughs> so it means that we are at least not obviously moronic in the direction we're taking. Okay. Cool. And then I think you, you'd written up something on DNS, Frederick? I have. And that um, sites that Google Doc, if you open it up, yep. shows the initial. So what I would like to do is I'd like to, well, let me give some background. So one of the things that we were looking at was what happens when you hook up, let's say multiple VPNs or even just a single VPN. So now you have two or more DNS servers that you have to resolve against. And so, one of them being your primary Kubernetes resolver, plus any additional secondary DNS resolvers that you that you attach on. And so, um, this one of the solutions that we're looking at is if, so. If you look at the second image, um, so is adding in a 
accordion, a sidecar. When we say sidecar, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a container in the same pod. It could be a uh, it could be another pod that is running a core DNS in in that area. Uh, actually, is that true? No, it has to be in the same container because it's because of the number namespace. But effectively, we want to set up a core DNS. We're looking at setting up a core DNS sidecar that is configured to use all of the uh, VPN servers that that you care about. So uh, is so first the I'd like to talk about whether even whether this is like a sane idea or whether or what problems we can run into before we jump into the into the provisioning side. Okay. Um, so does this does this look reasonable to people? Is, does this look like something like where where where, where can this thing break? So the the one that I I, I think I mentioned before when we discussed this that's a subtlety that's quite fixable is. I mean, obviously, <clears throat> if you've got a core DNS sidecar that's spanning out the DNS requests to not only the normal Kubernetes DNS, but possible DNSs upstream of the various network services, um, normally, if you get a positive response, you would actually like to pass through the first positive response you get. Um, you do have to be a little bit more cautious with negative DNS responses because you don't want to pass through the first negative DNS response you get um, because it may just be that somebody else has a response that's positive and they haven't gotten it to you yet. So when you say first response as well, is that literally like the first uh, response regardless as to which one it is? Or do you mean first as in like the Kubernetes would get uh, uh, priority and that's considered to be the first uh, response and then VPN one, regardless of the time ordering would be like the second response? I, I was thinking in terms of time ordering um, because you get very long latencies if you wait if you run through them serially, it's much more efficient to run through them in parallel. And the Kubernetes DNS is going to have a huge latency advantage in that um, not only is it running in the cluster, but generally speaking, the Kubernetes DNS is now moving to per node caches for DNS. Um, and as a result, you would expect that if Kubernetes DNS has something to say about it, it will have something to say about it really fast. Okay, so something we should probably consider in this scenario as well is making sure that um, we, for for certain domains, that if, uh, if if we can say like we want everything from uh, example.com, like all requests for example.com to go only through VPN one or VPN two. So I think we should. I think it would make sense to add to add something in like that, just so that you can say things in my private corporate internet. Uh, you're not pulling the public addresses; you're only pulling the private addresses for those. Probably super wise, especially considering the fact that there are people who run all kinds of crazy split DNS schemes. Um, where I see them way too often. Yeah, no, it, it's it's you. you Having beer with a really deep, um, with the really deep DNS guys, they will just bitch endlessly about it. But yeah, everybody does it. Um, <clears throat> so, but I mean, my, my, what I would encourage, because we're getting down to time here shortly, is folks to please go take a look at this and comment on it. This is going to be super important for us to support um, going forward. Yeah, I've added additional provisioning steps in there as well. So please go over the provisioning steps and. Uh, and let us know where it works and where it breaks. Yep. And I'm just gonna, for consistency, just make DNS a link there. Cool. There we go. Cool. Um, so the interdomain stuff, I'll, I'll go back and for next week, I'll put a link to that. We've got a spec for resiliency two is, right now we've got a good story where if any one network service manager or network service manager data plane dies, um, everything reconverges. And if you lose a network service endpoint, we auto heal. Um, Andre had some really smart ideas where we could literally lose all of the network service managers and all the network service manager data planes at the same time and still reconverge, um, which I think we're tentatively calling resilience CV2. If folks have other ideas for naming, that's awesome. Um, dynamic rewiring. So we have auto healing already um, in the system, meaning that if you lose a network service endpoint, 
we can re automatically reconnect a client to another network service endpoint to continue get continuity of service. Um, and we know that we can use the same mechanism so that if you change the, the network, the policy for the network service, we are capable of dynamically rewiring um, that mechanically. And I think there are even ways for us to do it safely because obviously you don't want to do it to everything all the time. That could be destructive. And that might, that should allow us to do a really cool example where imagine that you have a pod and it's consuming a network service and something is weird and you decide, you know, after the pod is running for a while, you, gee, wouldn't it be nice if you had a packet capture box uh, between the pod and everything else that was going on? Um, potentially you could use dynamic rewiring to do that and you could use something like WebShark to see what's really happening on the wire. And I don't know a single developer who doesn't want that capability. Wait, so, so specifically what I'm hearing is you can use a web server to display your captured packets uh, that you injected uh, with the listener you injected directly into the network service uh, wiring itself. Yep, yep. Cool. Yep. So, um, and then the hardware index SROV. Um, two things I do want to make sure is number one, I, I've, I've been starting to scribble and together an attempt at a network service mesh technology tree because some of these things do depend on each other. Um, you know, so for example, security has to be done before we can do interdomain. Um, and I've been trying to collect the various things here together. Um, so that we could at least sort of try and put some order on all of it. Um, and in, in, in doing that, one thing that became immediately obvious is we, we have been collecting specs on the spec board and it might be a good idea for us maybe today, maybe next week to go through the spec board and make sure that we capture those things and that we're getting them all organized uh, probably into the, the technology tree and other places. So we at least know what the bogeys are. Right. What are the things we could go work on uh, that people might want to go work on um, in the community? Because um, I know, for example, like there's a bunch of stuff that you had on the spec board, Matthew, around metrics. And I know we got some of that done, but I don't know if we've got all of that done. And like Qvert integration, I know you were interested in that, Jeffrey. Um, I'd want to make sure that we got that represented correctly. Um, we've got some new interesting things coming in around network aware load balancing where people have got suggestions for that. And so I just wanted to make sure we sort of walked through the spec board, make sure we were capturing all the specs and getting them filed correctly so they could be uh, worked on if people were interested in working on them. Make sure you ping uh, Jeffrey remotely because he had to dash. Okay. Cool. Awesome. So, um, yeah, so that was, that was what I did there. Um, it, it, it sounds like Nikolai, you thought the technology tree was potentially useful. Um, yeah, I mean, it was awesome. Also, also you're using the, um, Palit, like, uh, the logo Palit, I guess, like the yeah. colors. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I, I, I am using, I'm using the new colors and actually, I'm 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 not sure why why the capture NSC uh, needs dynamic rewiring. I mean, I can see, but I mean, I can see the use case where you kind of can inject dynamically the packet capture, but the pack, the, cap, the packet capture NSC can be part of a de already deployed service. So if you want to demo ah, that, yeah. yeah, there's a there's a cost of injecting cap, uh, packet capture in, so it's not a free thing. Uh, so you don't need it in order to in order to do the basic use case, but it becomes a lot more useful if you can rewire it in well, because you can. But I, I I think part of what because I know you you've been working on on, on this Nikolai in the sense of building a network service endpoint that can be configured to do a bunch of different things, and I think what we're suggesting is um, it would be you you could just build that into the network the NSC to begin with, supporting a packet capture network service that's something like the um, web. The, the web shark could connect to, and that's actually probably true now that you mention it. Ah, I see. So having the NSC itself be able to inject it in at the appropriate moment. Yeah, or, or just have the NSC provide the network service uh, for it. Um, yeah, it's a fantastic idea. You know, and, and so you can sort of sort that out. There, of course, obviously some interesting security things about there, um, but you know, I, I think they're relatively solvable within the framework that's emerging.
Um, yeah, yeah. So that 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 may that may actually be true. We may not actually need this uh, connection here. Okay, I will have to jump to another call. I'm sorry, today I'm a bit busy, so okay. I will have to leave you guys. And We're actually, kind of at the end, since we don't have Jeffrey to talk about data plane separation this time around. Yeah, unfortunately, tomorrow uh, we have an overlap with the CNCF CNFTS bed call for the doc call, so I won't be able to join the doc call. Um, I hope that someone else will be able to. No worries, we'll, uh, we'll cover it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for the, I did have a uh, brief talk with Jeffrey about the split data plane. Uh, and I think the concept was that you may have two data planes that have different capabilities that uh, would be complementary on the same node. And so the question would be how to uh, make sure like if one of them supported MIF and the other one supported SRLV, um, then like how would you, like how would you forward them onto the right things? So I think it's based around that just as a, as a teaser, uh, but I'll let Jeffrey talk about it next week because he has a more concrete use case in hand. Yeah, and, and quite honestly, there's going to be a little bit of that going on as well when we get to the hardware as well as next stuff. Because one of the things that's going to be super important is to make sure that we enable people who are buying hardware NICs to be able to provide the thing that handles the programming aspect of them so that we don't have to and they don't have to be really big patches. Uh, Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, anything else, guys, before we call it a meeting? Just just about the roadmap. Uh, it's it is a roadmap for the zero dot two version, or is there some kind of, some kind of uh, prior priority or something? Uh, yeah. So I I I I think it's just the roadmap in general. We just got zero dot one branch, uh, and so I'm not sure. Okay. Part of what lands and what release is going to depend on who's interested in working on what and when. Um, but the thing is, if, if we have a general notion of a roadmap, one of the things we can look at in 0.2 is do we want to do a time-based or a feature-based release? Um, and if we do a time-based release, then we'll sort of say, okay, we're going to release around here, and then we'll see what we can do we can get in by then. Um, and you know, the things that will drive that will be the priority with which people are interested in working on things, plus by the technology tree, um, like what has to happen before what else, right? Because um, inner domain without security is just not going to fly. Um, and then um, we can sort of proceed from there. I, I had originally done the, the tree. I tried putting a little like zero dot two or zero dot three on things, and I just realized it was completely arbitrary. It just depends on who works on what. Yeah, I think. Um... Which, regardless as to which direction we take, we should probably do releases relatively often, just so that we can get into the habit of doing the release and getting good at them. Like, if it's something that's going to be difficult and painful, then do it often so it becomes cheaper over time. Yeah, um, what 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 you what you do routinely uh, works. What you what you do occasionally often breaks. So if we only do one release of NSM a year, we're going to go through a lot of pain in getting it out. But if we do lots of little releases, then the little releases will be mostly painless over time. Yep, yep. But that's that's probably a good conversation topic for next week. Yeah, I agree. Awesome. So thank you guys. It's been great. Cheers, thank you very much. Um, and with that, uh, close it up and uh, see you all next week. Same time. Well, thank you, bye. Bye, everyone.